So for the month of August, we're really pleased to present the work of Liz Moore in her solo exhibition called By the Means Of. Um, American artist Sheila Hicks once described, you're not thinking about the grains of sugar. You're into a very big meringue, like a huge lemon meringue pie. Rich materiality has an immersive quality, a multisensorial effect that crosses the threshold from the physical into the psychological. These vivid tactile experiences give rise to questions pertaining to the spatial interplay between physical objects and the emotive states of being. How do material color and form relate to bodies that exist in the space around the work? Moreover, how do specific aesthetic choices engender and bring about the notion of affect? In her exhibition, By Means Of, Liz Moore tests our bodily capabilities through empathy and focus via tactility, vibrancy, and the shape of her natural fiber, a medium with a very heavy laden past. So to view the exhibition online and to read the full curatorial statement, you can click on the link in our bio after the studio visit. So now let's learn a little bit more about our speakers today, Liz Moore and Gretchen Wagner. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, Liz Moore creates felted and mixed media work. She received her MFA from Washington University in St. Louis and her BFA from the University of Kentucky. In 2018, she was published in the New American Paintings issue number 136 as an emerging artist to watch, as well as being featured in Art Maze magazine, London, UK. She was the recipient of the Arthur Oswald Scholarship and Sam Fox School Travel Grant in 2019 to travel to Germany and Mexico to research natural dye fiber techniques and contemporary color theory. In 2020, she won second place at Miami University's Young Painters Competition and exhibited her work in the St. Louis Textiles Fiber Biennale. Her works have recently been shown at the Kemper Art Museum, Miami University in Oxford, Ghost Art Projects, Intersect Chicago, and the World of Co. Artist Residency in Sofia, Bulgaria. Gretchen Wagner is a curator, art historian, and writer based in St. Louis. She has completed projects featuring modern and contemporary art at institutions internationally, including St. Louis Art Museum, MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, Pulitzer Arts Foundation, the Wells Contemporary Art Center, Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, the Print Center, Tang Teaching Museum Art Gallery at Skidmore College, and William College Museum of Art, among others. Her projects explore the diverse themes, including investigation of global abstraction and conceptualism, art and environment, and the intersection of public and institutional space. Most recently, she organized exhibitions titled Graphic Revolution, a look at the social history of the United States through the lens of printed art, and the shape of abstraction, selections from Ali collection, which celebrated abstraction by contemporary black artists, both at the St. Louis Art Museum. Wagner holds degrees in art history from the University of Wisconsin Medicine and Williams College. So thank you, Liz and Gretchen, for uh, speaking with us today. Um, I'm gonna let you take it from the hair. And those of you who are signed on to Liz's um, IG Live account, you might wanna switch over to Riddle because I'm gonna log off and let um, Liz and Gretchen take it from here. So thank you and enjoy the studio visit. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, Candace. that was fantastic. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you for um, hosting us and, um, uh, and yeah, let's launch into the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I always love hearing intros and hearing what people have done before. Because I know you so well, but hearing yes. it all said out loud, I'm like, wow, that was really great. Yes, that's that's me. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I meant. Also, yeah. too, I think we should say if you if you ever have any trouble hearing us, please say a comment. I'll have Joe tell us if we need to speak up for any reason. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. Great. So again, thanks for having me here, Liz. This yeah. is this is such a treat. Um, I've been to your studio a couple of times, working on some projects. Um, um, so some writing projects on your work and uh, here we are today. So what what brought you to working with wool? Um, how, how did that become your primary medium? Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, wool was my lifesaver <laughs> about I think eight years ago now and I was 
making primarily mono prints in the pr amazing printmaking studio at the time at the University of Kentucky. And I was working under Ebony G. Patterson as a, she's my painting professor and she's an amazing artist. And one day she just said, you know, what if you made paintings with fabric? And I was like, ingenious, you know? So it goes on, I'm, I'm playing around. And then I worked with Crystal Gregory, who is also an amazing fiber artist. I always love giving all my amazing artists a shout. And um, I just learned about felting. It's a really big practice in Kentucky because there's a lot of agricultural land there and there's a lot of sheep there. And so actually at UK, there's a felting machine, which there's a video um, in the gallery for Re-Riddle of me working on that machine at UK. And the fiber department at UK actually created and invented that machine. And so felting was kind of a big thing. Um, and so anyway, I, as I started working with felting, I started to realize that laying down colors and laying down shapes was so much more manageable to the way my brain operates and how intuitive I am as I make. And so I didn't have to worry and dread putting down a mark. And then if it didn't work, having to completely start a painting all over, which I, was my constant um, stutter as a maker at the time. And so felt just gives you so much flexibility because you can lay down a piece of wool and then just take it off. And, and you know, everything is dry the way I felt in particular. So it's just, for me and my intuitive nature, it just, we, we gilded well. So how, so <laughs> tell me a little bit about what, for, for those of us out there, including myself, um, um, you know, what, what does felting entail? What's, how is that different than spinning wool or right. knitting wool or, you know, right. just, just in, a, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. just so people kind of understand what that's about? Yeah, I would say felting is the most bare bones fiber process ever. I, even spinning wool to then weave it um, is kind of going through all these processes where wool is taking raw wool, even if it, I mean, you clean it, obviously, it's coming from a live animal, and so you have to clean it, and then you can do it two ways. You can felt with another piece of wool below, and you, you, you set it up, actually, in a grid form, the way you would set up a weaving, um, but I use needles that punch through the bottom layer, and as they're coming up, the needles have these divots, and so when they're coming up through the bottom layer, the divots catch the bottom layer and pull it through the top. So actually, as it's being felted with the needle, the bottom layer is coming up to the top and they're kind of tangling together. The way I felt it, though, my base is um, silk organza, which is another, again, natural fiber. And I just really like the way silk plays with the wool. And when it's felted very tightly, the felt start to get this kind of wave and body. And so, so that's, that's what I do. And I lay down a piece of foam or sometimes you can lay down even, um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. I won't get into the technicalities, but um, you just lay down a, a, a pretty thick layer of foam. And as you're punching through, you have to have a space to go into because right. um, the needles are pretty long. And so I hand felt mostly. So everything you see here, I, I guess, except for this piece is all hand felted, um, which I, I'm really proud of <laughs> because the felting machine is so large. So it's really easy to, you know, make these kind of big beginning layers and then kind of build up from there. Yeah. So you were talking about this process of entanglement that would have that happens with the fibers. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I love that way of thinking about it and, mm -hmm. and, you know, breaks away from, I don't know, kind of any sense, the ideas of logic. So I was wondering right. what kind of unexpected things start to happen when you felt? Are there right. surprises along the way when you're working with the wool? Yes. That's why I love felting too. There's just so, I, do we have a problem with audio, Joe? No. Okay, great. Um, there's just so many nuances to felt. It's such, and again, it's such a bare bones medium. It's just wool and silk and a needle. There's no binder. You know, there's, there's, um, it, it's so bare bones. And so as I make, there's just so much more to find. And something that I found with this series specifically, which makes it so special is I started to realize as I was punching through to create the wool on the, this side, I started to recognize that it was coming through the other side in this really interesting way and kind of showing me on the back 
my, you know, as I punched through, it was making new marks in the back that were completely unexpected. And I never paid attention to the back as much in the past works. And so the way that the wool is coming through when you're doing two colors, especially, is they basically are switching places. And this color is showing up on this side and this color is showing up on this side. And I, I think that entanglement is also inherent to just how I think about the work. I mean, I'm not a very traditional craft fiber person, even though I really appreciate I really appreciate traditional craft artists. Um, I just have never subscribed to a very logical, mathematical approach. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a much more intuitive maker, as you said. So the surprise of the wool in the sense, too, that as I'm laying down and, and punching through, the wool will move out of the way of the oh. needles, too. And so I'm not having to... Um, I'm, I'm kind of responding a lot more to the wool than saying, you will go here. As it, as it moves, then I move and I add, and we're kind of in this tango together. Right, right, so right. I love, I love that part about it. Yeah, well, I mean, that to me brings up, you, you had, um, you know, mentioned that you come from, or some of your first experiences in art school were working with painting, and mm -hmm. you kind of started there and moved away, and also prints, and, yeah. um, and so how, you know, the way that you're describing things of kind of this intuitiveness and um, is really so much in line with certain discourses in painting, right? Definitely. It's sort of related right. to 20th century modernism. Right. And um, so how, how does fiber, wool, maybe in particular any fiber, really for you, um, what's the relationship to painting? Like, what was that leap that you had to take? Tell right. me about that. Or, or what do you think? What is what does wool do for you that paint can't? Or right. Do? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I love painting still just in my free time, but I just think now to me, wool is far superior to acrylic or oil in my own practice because wool again is so flexible. I mean, it's literally flexible as a fiber, but even as you're laying down and making marks, you can easily take it off, add more, layer them. And because wool is a you know um a porous material it's it's not a dense material like in the way in which acrylic is so for example when you're laying down acrylic you have to really water it down or really add some sort of um some sort of binder to make it easy to layer mm -hmm. and I think too like I really like to go into the work heavy-handed and so I think that's why painting kept failing for me because I was making these massive gestures of these like thick paint mm. you know marks and then it would be too thick and then I'd, I'd have to start over and or I'd have to remove the paint and etc so the way in which the felt is is porous it's letting light go through and so as you continue to layer them the light that's going through the wool and then the other different colors the way that they layer together and the way that light is constantly going through the wool it's never completely flat mm -hmm. so it's kind of also to me, painting is so interesting because it is a flat surface playing with three-dimensional, you know, content. But I think that the felt are actually a three-dimensional object playing with two-dimensional content. So it's kind of the reverse. And I, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of ways for me to make marks that I don't know. It's just more meaningful to me. Yeah. They're just meaningful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, it's, it's such an interesting um, uh, tension that's been in play since, and we can talk about this a little bit later because I want to dive into these specific works that we have behind us that mm -hmm. are in the re exhibition, but it's all, but that, that idea be, between painting and sculpture and textiles, certain, certainly such a, a rich tension that has been in play for the past, you know, 60, 70 years or so um, as, yeah. as fibers kind of move into the more the fun, quote unquote, fine art world, which right. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that um, and, 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 and that kind of dialogue that's been going on. But first, yeah. I'd like to get a sense of, we're talking so much about the materials here. Um, could you walk us through a little bit about, uh, 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 walk us through the works that you have in the exhibition? What yeah. are some of the themes? Um, that are coming up for you in this work, um, um, materials, ideas. Yeah. 
Um, well, the, all of this work was made during COVID. And so I think it, I really like hearing about how COVID impacted artists specifically because we're so, for me, I'm so visually driven, but I'm also so atmospheric driven. And so being taken away from people for so long um, was really interesting. And, and so a lot of this work is a lot of my musings on um, space and light. And a lot of the work is my attention to windows and, and portal spaces, spaces to where I'm able to enter out of my own COVID brain, you know, leave this isolation for just a minute. And so I started to recognize how, how much, and I think for a lot of people, like how much in nature started to play a role as an, a daily importance. Like I have to get out of my house, I have to go outside and see something else and not think about what's happening in this, you know, COVID is such an unseen thing. It's a virus, you know, so it's in our brains. And so we needed something tangible to see. And so I, I and nature had always been a part of my work anyway. I loved wall. It's just a, it's a pattern that really shows up in my work a lot and influences me. And, and I always think about the dualities of nature, how it's, safe and also dangerous and all these things and so anyway I started thinking more about the doorways to nature and and how they were actually these moments of hope for me like I can get out of this mindset and go somewhere else and so um and so the works have this kind of like grid like structure a lot of them and um and actually the discovery I was talking about with the felt going through the back I really started to play that up in these works where they are um, able to be seen from both sides and presented from both sides, but also the way in which the felt is coming through the back in the way in the, which the light catches the really, um, you know, tiny, fragile wool particles that are coming through the back. When you're looking at the works, I mean, I guess I could explain. When you're looking at the works um, dead on, it's a little bit more translucent and opaque the lines kind of fade. And I think that's mostly because the wool was punched straight through the back. And so the, the wool is coming out straight. But when you go from the side and look from the side, the lines start to come out because they're punching out this way. They're catching all the light from the side. All the pigments are to come out. So there's a lot of, um, I guess there's, I, I was really paying attention to light and really paying attention to, you know, mark the pigment and how to even have such a powerful, uh, approach in the way in which pigment can actually become alive and have movement. Um, and so, sorry, if you hear that this is my my air conditioning. It, it is off. It's okay. Hopefully it just turns off. Okay. Well, I think that <laughs> <laughs> the, the air conditioning will have its... Yeah, my air conditioning <laughs> turned turn it off. <laughs> my heat yeah. carrier yeah. was Tamiya. I'm sorry. <laughs> you do is the one that... Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, what I think is so um, interesting about this body of work uh, is that it brings into, um, you, you've, in previous projects, you've thought about space and how these textiles can occupy space um, because you built structures that, and sculpture that has yeah. been around, essentially. Right. But this is um, such a interesting and kind of more subtle approach to space because of exactly what you're talking about, how these fibers right. are um, on these different planes within these works. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's something that in person sitting here, it's just this phenomenal effect of how color begins to play with each other because there is this slight variation of space spatial depths right. within these works that look like painting. They're not right. kind of structured like painting, right? You're referencing yeah. the grid. It's working with painting. It's the picture window. It's mm -hmm. all of that discourse. Right. And yet it has this amazing play of color on different plane. Right. That almost goes into the realm of, I don't know, you know, kind of how digital images are constructed or this, yeah. you know? And it's, so it's this really interesting encapsulation of all this art historical, you know, <laughs> knowledge and methodology all together, but right. then held together by threads, which also, um, you know, it's kind of sheer gravity that's keeping everything together. Yeah, <laughs> that's the magic of felt. Again, like there is no 
there's absolutely no binder holding this piece together. And it even tricks you, you know, it's like, I'm a grid, it has this grid like shape, but the, that has absolutely nothing to do with the structure of, of what's holding it together. And so I think the way in which felt kind of tricks you as a viewer and, and lets the pigment play in these different ways and the light really changes, changes its body it has so much beingness, it has such a liveliness that I think for me is so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I love it. Yeah, well, but and also it's it's interesting to think about in terms of someone like Bob Morris, right? Yeah. Like using felt, I mean, totally different way, right. totally thinking, you know, it's industrial felt, it's not mm -hmm. the handmade, it's, but it's working with its gravity, it's, right. its relationship to gravity, right? That yeah. kind of false, but you're de dealing with a way that's the same two elements kind of but completely differently. Yeah, I would even expand that too. Yeah. Sheila Hicks, I love the quote from Sheila Hicks mentioned by Candace earlier. And Sheila Hicks is a huge influence of mine. And I think even with Sheila Hicks, Hicks work too, she is just a huge pioneer for me to be able to even do this in the art world, you know, which I think is so amazing. But Sheila Hicks sculptures are mainly still representing balls of yarn, hanging strings of yarn. They still assess and speak in the language of, um, you, you know, utilitarian fiber. Like this looks like yarn, this looks like a mm -hmm. yarn ball. Mm -hmm. There's still gravity in play. I think yeah. the power of her work is the mm -hmm. scale. It's so large and it, it's so um, monumental. But I think that, I think that the curiousness of my work too, and kind of, I think what I'm adding to the discourse hopefully is that it doesn't speak anything of utilitarian content at all. And so I, I think that's why it hangs such an interesting tone. It, is it a painting? Is it mm -hmm. a sculpture? Mm -hmm. Is it fiber? And I, and I, I think that um, it actually lands in its completely own realm and niche. And so I'm, I really like thinking about that too. Yeah. Um, even amongst the fiber world, like again, it's not woven, or if it is woven, it's tricking you because right. actually it's structured through the dreading of needle to, mm -hmm. to wool and silk. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> well, so this is, you know, the, the kind of more of a focus on um, the, the the wall bound, let's call it work, even though they're not necessarily bound to the, you know, right. the wall. But th right. that's somewhat of a new, new direction for you. You've worked in larger, mm -hmm. like you said, sculpture in the round, um, mm -hmm. um, objects in the round works. Could you talk a little bit about, about that previous work to give some context um, yeah. with other, and also tell just the, the, the range of how you work with fiber? Yeah, so I, I make large sculptures <laughs> too. And um, most of the large sculptures I've made have been um, mainly thinking again about scale. And I think, I think it kind of goes back to Sheila Hicks. Like Sheila Hicks, in her era as well as an artist in you know the 1960s she had 1950s 1960s she she kind of had to make fiber a big deal and so the scale had to be present because fiber still is kind of this new avenue are we going to show this in a museum wow like okay new thing and so the scale had to be had to be there and i think for me when i started making these felt i i actually felt a very similar tenacity to that because felt still was not showing up in the art world as much as I thought it would be. Like when I started looking into it more, Joseph Boys made a wool suit and Sheila Hicks makes these wool sculptures. Um, Fred Sandback. Right. Yeah, you know, there's like a few yeah. here and there, but then you have, you know, the Annie Albers weaving club and there's a million amazing weavers who are just expanding weaving into this really amazing, I mean, I could just, seeing a million amazing weaver artists that I know, but I just wasn't seeing that with felt. And so I think I felt this kind of need, like felt needs to be respected. I'm gonna bump up the scale. So I just started making these really large felt pieces and, and I, the way in which I thought about form as well was a huge, form is so important to me again with space. I think these works are talking more about light and transparency mm -hmm. and space in the sense of blurring, blurriness and and things are like that but I think the form of the sculptures they're so large and they're so unruly they most of the sculptures forms are representing a mark themselves they're not you know they're not sculptural in the, in the terms of 
you know, traditional sculpture, they're, they're way more um, flowy and they're allowing the wool to move around them. And it's kind of this, um, I call them a constant state of becoming, like they're just always becoming something else. And they're so large that the more you move around them, you're catching new things. And so um, I, I, think, I think color, scale, and mark making are kind of the three pillars that hold my practice together. And so that's really the umph that the sculptures hold for me. And some of them do have um, reference to your to your background or to your to your history, places you've been, right? People that you've met or been with, um, yeah. You know, know, yeah. So. You never know if you're going to become one of my sculptures. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, one of the sculptures that I that I made, I guess, in the last year is um, is pulled from a twall pattern, like I mentioned before, twall was really influencing my work. It was making me think a lot about um, the Baroque era and architectural design and, um, and art and design basically becoming one, that kind of era to which that started to happen and pattern and decoration, all these things. And so I made this, I pulled one element out of this very complicated pattern that had a very charged history of colonialism and, um, you know, like a very, a very harsh history. I just thought, you know, like what if I pulled out one element from this pattern and I made it covered in yellow felt. It's going to be very electric, but I think it'll have a quietness and a peace about it that maybe the pattern would have never been able to hold. Mm -hmm. Even though the pattern is very important to me and it, it, it's, it's chaos is very inherent to its design. But anyway, I made this really large tree and um, I, again, it's like, it, it's just so bizarre how, how, when the felt is wrapped in a sculptural way, it has this quietness about it um, because the wool is so soft and we think that's so cliche, but actually the way in which wool soaks in light, mm -hmm. it the sculptures have this like very, I think, peaceful calmness about it. So anyway, I like taking really charged, harsh things and kind of empathizing with them and contending with them and making them a little bit more, um, you know, agreeable and or able to be digested. Mm -hmm. I guess I think about that a lot too. Like I like blurring lines and, and really allowing complexity in the blurriness. And so what way. about what about textile history and about the twall that that did you really dive into and, and explore? Yeah, I mean oh my entire thesis is about this, yeah. so I'll keep it short. Um, but Twal, I grew up with Twal in my, and we can talk, actually, this would be a perfect avenue into, I guess, my my maternal history as yeah. well. But yeah. um, my mom made me this Twal bedding because um, I just thought Twal was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. And if you're watching, Twal de Joy is the official full title. And it's a French fabric. And the way it's set up is it's a repetitive pattern. It's a usually a pastoral landscape. It was made by farmers originally, so very humble beginnings. And it was basically just a reflection of their life in a pastoral way. And so it had their cows and their chickens and their kids and et cetera. And so this became affluent right when, um, you know, the era of Marie Antoinette and these very Baroque high class people started taking over France. And so they started covering their entire houses with this pattern, their drapes, their bedding, their wallpaper, everything was covered. So it was, it's very arresting when you walk into a room of Toile. And, and busy, I mean, and it's really, it's I mean, so busy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It takes over. Right, and naturally as it started to become taken over by these people, their, their class was higher than the farmers and so the, imagery started to change to represent their ideal of what it was to live as a French person. Mm -hmm. And so they kept, they kept the uh, facade of pastoral living, even though they were like literally Queen Marie Antoinette living in this high powered castle. And, um, and they kind of started to blur the lines like, we're still simple French folk, but actually we're covered in these, you know, golden gilded decor and people are starving outside our castle, but who cares? And so it started to become this like very charged pattern to the point where in American history, um, people who supported 
Eisenhower, there's an Eisenhower's wall. And it was a way to support people. So it became a very political pattern, a very political, um, you know, pattern imagery. And so I, so I had this as a child, <laughs> loved it. And learning about the history of it, I think it started to show me that there's just so much, um, there's so much about things, especially in fiber that we see. And if without really spending time to look into the history of them, we would never know. And I think that's also the, um, you know, the uh, maybe contrast, even with paintings, like a painting could look so dreamy. And then the more you look at it, you're like, oh, wait, that, you know, woman is cutting this guy's head off. I didn't see that at first because the painting is so beautiful. And so I think it's that, um, it's that, you know, really thin line of, of imagery and the way art has power. And so I started taking to all this thing that I adored as a child. And then I learned of this really interesting, you know, political history. And I just wanted to neutralize it again and kind of see if I could change the imagery back into a place of its intentionality, which I think I just like when things are simple. <laughs> I think it's a, a pleasure I take as an artist because again, we can do anything we want to do. And so, um, and so anyway, I'm very, I'm very interested in textile history, depicts of my history and all of the women in my family. Right. And so, and so that brings, you know, on that topic, your, you have a long lineage of women who have worked with fiber, worked as fiber artists, although they, the, the form, or the, the way they did it was maybe right. in many different ways, working as seamstress or now yourself as a, you mm -hmm. know, um, working in this context. Um, so what of that um, have you brought with you into the work? Yeah, I always say that I, that I am from a long line of fiber artists. I'm the first one to be given that title <laughs> because um, my, my fifth great grandmother made, um, made curtains and bedding for her neighborhood. And it was kind of her way to make money and to support her family. And that just ended up getting passed down to every new maternal um, person, down to me, which is very amazing. And so um, I grew up around just really ornate, amazing fibers. Like my curtains in my bedroom were these gorgeous, billowy, pink linen curtains that I just thought, I mean, they are the most gorgeous curtains I've still ever seen. And they're made by my great grandmother, and they survived for so long. And just the detail and, um, is amazing. And so I grew up around, um, you know, my mom making our curtains and and the history of my great grandmother made the curtains for the governor's mansion in Atlanta, and of course her name is nowhere to be found. And so, anyway, I think being surrounded by these very large draping textiles, um, you know, coming from these women who just wanted to make their home a lovely place, I think I, there's just a sense right there that I really I'm attracted to, and I think I, I do naturally as well. I think that's maybe why my work is abstract as well as kind of allowing for interpretation and um, yeah, it hangs in a similar way as drapes, I think, even though they're not, again, they're, they're not really speaking to utilitarian language. And so I think mm -hmm. they're kind of an interesting way right. you know, to carry down some of that idea. But also, this idea that there are. Um, within these ecosystems of power, right? right. That, it's, that I mean, and there's long history, there's some you know, amazing, um, amazing books written on, you know, where tex textile um, is situated within, um, you know, history of industrialization, history yeah. of um, um, slavery, um, all of that. I mean, it's completely bound up history of, um, um, you know, the feminist movement, all of this is bound kind of up into the, um, the material itself. Um, right. And also the fact that, um, you know, it has this, this place that kind of carries all this history with it, but yet part of that history is kept and then part of the history of who made it and who, right. you know, is not, you know, right. it's like left, it's left to, um, you know, uh, yeah, to, 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 um, to be lost. And so right. I think that that's something that's constantly like circulating and something that's been navigated by so many of the individuals who have, um, worked on, um, 
worked with textiles who kind of vacillate between the art world and the say craft world. And you, Sheila Hicks, and I, was, I was reading something I thought it was so fascinating. She does not like to sign her work. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> not into it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And, and yeah, and so I think that, that that kind of freeing of that expectation in terms of, you know, in the studio arts or whatnot, or by or in the artists or makers hands, um, is is something that must come out of this history right. in a way, right? right. Like, like yeah, that, you know, it just it it was something that um, I don't know for good for you know for however you want to uh, yeah. assess it. Um, mm -hmm. That association with the maker and what was made is just not as strong as, say, maybe a painting or whatnot. Of course, right. there's all kinds of other or a sculpture. I mean, yeah. no, I think it's very interesting, and I think that um, you know, for example, like my my grandmother who made the governor's mansion in Atlanta's curtains. I mean, they're gorgeous. They're documented in books, and the governor's mansion is a very big deal, and and it's always being redone. Like every ten years, it's like this big redo. Um, and the, the daughter of my, of my, or sorry, the son of that grandmother of mine is my grandfather. And he really supports my practice and it's amazing. I, I love that relationship I have with him, but he's always saying like, you know, how are you going to, when I started making these, he's like, how are you going to sign the works? And so I was trying to stitch on the back, but it really doesn't work well because the felt is so intertwined from the front to the back. And so. I really couldn't sign it, but it's very interesting because I think he kind of saw how she was not getting any recognition at all. Because yeah. he wouldn't, you know, sign a drape, right? You know, right. but he, even her name in books is not kept, and so I think it's very. I've never really thought about that fully, but he was very adamant that I signed my work, and so yeah. I think it's. I think it's actually kind of a power. I think about this a lot with quilts. You know, a lot of the, a lot of women's names, especially in the South, are not recorded with the quilts that were made. And a lot of them were just avenues to express stories or narrative or pass down, you know, knowledge and things of this nature. And I think there's actually a power and the humility that my name is not attached to this thing. It's actually serving the next generation. And so right. I think there is something special to fiber in that way in which it's passed down, but it doesn't always have to be used. It could be just be hung up and observed mm -hmm. and, you know, like art is, you yeah. know, it's like right. almost like the fiber is the original right. art and nobody right. knew. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's, um, here, I'm just looking at the time. We, we have, oh, I don't know, about five or so more minutes and we'll open it up to, to um, Q&A if anybody would like to, to throw yeah. some questions um, Liz's way. Um, but I think, you know, this is something that, oh, I, I know, I want to ask you before we run out of time, is that, you know, because your work has, is research driven in many ways, you really know what you're working with. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these yeah. um, on-site, um, you know, research trips that you've made, um, how it's informed your work? You've told me about a couple of them, and, and also just working with the material, going out there and finding the materials themselves. Yeah. Oh, this is my favorite part of being an artist at all, is just um, letting the work tell me what it needs. And um, I guess in the past, I'll, I'll tell you about Mexico, learning pregnant dying, but I'll share first a local experience because everyone's, um, you know, mostly locked to their state at this moment. So maybe this will be inspiring um, for some of you. But I recently felt as if I needed to know more about the source of my material. I, I was feeling very propelled to really understand where this is coming from and, and you know, if it's sourced reasonably and et cetera. And I get all my wool from the Woolery in Kentucky. All the wool is sourced from New Zealand or Kentucky itself. So I, um, I was very interested in that. And so anyway, I was like, I want to shear a sheep, you know? I, I should do it because I'm using their wool all the time. I should, you know, really go see what it's all about. And so I called a few people who knew some, um, some other people who owned alpacas and sheep. And this one lovely woman said, sure, come to my farm in Mexico, Missouri, which if you guys don't live in Missouri, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's an amazing place. You feel like you're in England. And so I 
drive to Mexico, Missouri, <laughs> two hours outside of St. Louis, and I sheared alpacas, which was an amazing experience. Um, there's actually this, um, you know, this roadie crew that travels from the West Coast through the East Coast, and people call on them, you know, the season before, mm -hmm. asking them, and they prepare the schedule. And so, anyway, it's this whole production, and the animals are just so cute. Like the alpacas, they're, you know, all waiting, and then we pick them up and lay them down. And it's very angelic. Um, and so I was able to help shear just one. I, I was dedicated to one leg that they had to, you know, really make sure I was doing it right. <laughs> and I, and I sheared alpaca for, you know, nine hours and it was so hard and so grueling, but it was so worthy of the experience because I think to see where you're getting your materials from, it just makes you respect the quantity even so much more. Now when I have a bag of wool, I think, you know, this animal grew this for an entire year and then a whole team had to shear this and then, Oh, and the whole other team had to wash this and then put it in this right. bag and it's in right. to me. So I kind of feel like I'm also partnering with this really, you know, very interesting mm -hmm. part of um, America who is kind of in this more agricultural industrial field and they have no idea right. what I'm doing with their work too. It's this really, mm -hmm. I, I like thinking about it in a collaborative way. And so that's kind of one big thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, and I, do, you, do, you think, do, you, do you see yourself going out more to really, you know, kind of understand that the full cycle of where because I know you're w working with dives as well or you're yeah. really exploring where, where different um dying procedures right yeah so I went to Mexico um in 2019 the summer before the pandemic so lucky and I did a residency called Architopia um they're amazing if you're looking for a residency and I worked with this man, Manuel, who owned a cochineal farm, which is a type of insect that feeds off of the Nepali prickly pear cactus. And so I um, went to a farm and I worked one-on-one -on -one with Manuel. And I basically just kind of helped him harvest the cochineal and we would go also pluck um, all of these different types of vegetation that were just around in the area, which was really special for me you can do this in America too. There's so many guides, and depending on what state is available mm -hmm. and things of this nature. And anyway, I learned how to do natural dyeing because I've been working with synthetic dye and a lot of synthetic material for so long. And I actually started having, um, you know, really adverse physical effects from mm -hmm. it. I was having a lot of lung problems and breathing problems. Um, and that's a whole other, you know, PhD is me making my own natural art supply book. I would just love for our students to stop using foam and, and, you know, great stuff, spray and, you know, right, right. PSA is coming to you in yeah. 10 years, yeah. my PhD, yeah. um, on natural materials. <laughs> but anyway, learning, learning natural dye was so amazing because there's such a peace of mind about it too. You know, you can dip your hand into a vat of, you know, plant powered, die and you don't have to worry about getting cancer when you're 45 and so anyway I I learned an amazing amount of skills and and wealth of knowledge in Mexico and um it was such a cool way to also learn about how cochineal also was colonized when the Spanish came to Mexico and it used to be that every family had cochineal in their backyard and every family had this ability to take cochineal and dye it and you know make their clothes with it and it was this very you know, normal thing, mm -hmm. and then it was overtaken by the Spanish, and, and so I feel like I keep running into these, you know, these things that I, that I love and I adore that I, you think are just so simple and natural, and then they have these charged histories that, right. you know, they're twisted, so I think, um, you know, that, that's a whole other thing, but my, my research keeps, like, showing me that the world is just so complicated, there's mm -hmm. just so much balance mm -hmm. of evil and good, and I think, for me, it's like, it's looking at those really complicated, really tangled histories and kind of laying them out, right. um, abstracting them, blurring them, and, and kind of allowing a new, a new scope of vision and understanding. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I was wondering, um, last question before I open it up to the audience out there. So please um, post, start posting your questions. 
what's what's next? What's what's yeah. like here? We're sitting in St. Louis now, but I think yeah. there's a, a move coming so people can know where where to find you, but also um, new ideas you're wanting to explore. Um, yeah, tell us all about it. Yeah, I'm moving to Atlanta. <laughs> I'm very sad to leave St. Louis. It's been a really amazing community. The community here is amazing, of course. Um, but I'm moving to Atlanta very soon. And um, I, as I was working through this series and as I started to explore felt coming through and to, from the back um, through to the front, mm -hmm. I started thinking, wow, I should start playing around with the silk more and because the silk is the kind of, you know, that medium between the felt that's sandwiched between. And so I'm, I'm thinking about painting onto the silk and it, which is also, again, another, it's, it's natural silk. And so I'm thinking about painting um, on the silk and, and creating even more space for the work to be hung in the round. Um, because again, I think the work being, you know, tied to a structure or being tied to the wall mm -hmm. are two ways to see it. But I think it being completely hung in the round is where I'm going to next, which I'm really yeah. excited about because I think it's going to open up a lot of really interesting paths for the work to be seen in a new way. And so, absolutely, and to and to follow um, and get into dialogue with so many amazing um, artists who have yes. worked in that in that form, really working with mm -hmm. the space, bringing fiber into the space, and seeing yeah. how it can behave and what yeah. it can do. I think a lot about Pivolati Wrist. She is my complete inspiration right now. I mean, for a few years, and I think a lot about how. Her installations, when you're moving through them, the pieces are moving as your body moves. Mm. And so I think that it's going to be a whole new level. Fascinating. It's going to be a whole new level. Oh, yeah. yeah. And also, you know, so visually rich and just, and also plays with scale in so many different ways. And, and um, oh, that'll be great. Right. Well, keep, keep us posted. Yes. That is fantastic. We're so sad to lose you here in St. Louis, <laughs> but we have the internet. And Atlanta is not that far, right. so that is great. Um, I'll open it for questions. Please send them in. If there's any questions, um, post them, and maybe Joe, Joe you see me come through. I'll do my, I'll do my best. Or I can, you know what? I am going to hop on. You can just read them, and I will I read them. Around, so we haven't seen like any of this work. Do we want to do? It? All right. Oh, I'm, yeah, I guess I, yeah, those questions are coming. Okay, up. here's one. Um, what, from Windsor 467, what's your favorite project that you've worked on thus far? That's a good question. Um, I'll show you. I think I'm going to show them the wall molds because I yes. haven't talked about that yet. So I'll actually pick one of these up for you, and Joe can come close. But this, thanks for your question. This is my favorite series right now. Um, it is called my wall mold series. This is inspired from my studio in Mexico. I looked up one night and my entire ceiling was full of molds, but it was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, I should make a wall mold series, um, making these um, pieces that kind of represent molds, but also have these, these beautiful assets. And again, I, I love my maternal history and I pull from that a lot. And so all of the jewelry in these works are from my grandmothers passed down and a lot of them are jewels that they were they wore on their first day to work or you know these kind of big um days these pieces and the way that this these are just a few of them but the they hang in in different orientations wherever they are and they kind of have this very great elusive effect and um they're just always you know they, they kind of play between the beauty and grotesque a lot. And yeah, I just think they're really special. They're just a really special, gradual work. No, those are great. And when they're hung in a group and cascading through the architecture, again, it goes back to your thinking about space and, yeah. how, and how they can exist in space. Yeah, so right. um, I know I wish we could, um, well, if people would like to see more images of that, of those, the, the, the oh, yeah. molds, they can look on the Rerodal yes. website because I think there's an installation photo. Yes, there's the an installation view 
um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. of that installation. Um, yeah. Okay, so another question. Uh, is there anything that you resist through your practice? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question. Ah, resist. Um, gosh, I think my biggest resistance is probably mm, is probably when I'm starting a work, I try to immediately cut the the silk before I start felting because I don't want to stay in a grid. <laughs> or if I or if I do want to stay in a grid, then I don't cut it. But I think cutting or not cutting the silk is always that is the biggest threat to my practice. In the yeah. same way that laying down acrylic or or um, yeah, I guess acrylic in a painting, there's a threat there because if it doesn't work. And you, you could scrape it off hopefully before it dries, but you kind of have to contend with that. And so right. for me, assessing how the silk is going to affect the entirety of the, of the whole piece is my biggest resistance. Right, right. For sure. Right. Well, it's interesting because it's, again, that idea that you'll have to be bounded by some sort of support. Right. And it's what, you know, why you working with fiber is what you, where you gravitated in the first place kind of full, comes full circle mm -hmm. like where you were trying to get away from um these kind of you know the can't the shape of the can't you know like yeah being kind of hemmed in by motor painting or whatnot right. and like the the fiber just like kind of lets you mm -hmm. move more freely right mm -hmm. and the silk you have to kind of cut to size to, to get yeah. to kind of where um to start you off or yeah. not, and you want that freedom. I right. think that that's... <laughs> that's a really good question. That really is a great, great question. question. That is um, a great question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about that more. Um, let's see here. Um, I think there's partial question coming in. Anyone else out there, please, please send them in. I'll be... Bureau Home said, can you? Yeah, somebody, you know, <laughs> Bureau Home, can you? So we're waiting for... <laughs> I bet you, I bet you she can. <laughs> <laughs> she can, she can, definitely. Um, maybe, can you talk a little bit about... Um, uh, it just return to the works in the the re riddle exhibition and yeah sure um, yeah maybe yeah. just yeah if you want to like just point it because I know that yeah. we really haven't had a chance to maybe look yeah at yeah maybe, so sure yeah. yeah so um so there's there's three kind of you know I'll give you kind of a uh, the in person experience because sometimes you don't get this on online and actually the photos are shot to be placed in the Rita Riddle Gallery online so that you do get a sense. So I'll just give you a little, little more hint and tip. Um, so in each work, there is a piece that has a, a shifting element. And so in this piece, the silk behind is the shifting element. Depending on where you stand, it looks pink from one end and then it looks green on another end. And that was kind of also what started me being able to play with the silk as an element. And, um, and also in this work, um, or in this like mark here, the orange is coming through the back and up here the mark is on top. And so there's a really interesting, I don't know if you wanna get close in here, Joe, but there's just a lot of interesting play with the color and the mark making and um, the way again, the silk is kind of starting to envelop amongst the entire work itself. Um, <laughs> kind of cool. And then I showed you as I guess earlier about how when you're standing in front of this work, even when you're really close up, this almost completely evades and disappears, this pink stripe. But then from the side, it starts to pop out more. And so it's kind of an amazing, it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's almost like, like what you said, it's, it's quite digital in the sense that it has this kind of um, like looping effect and it's changing, mm -hmm. but it's all very dense and physical. Um, and then this work is shifting in the sense that as you look at it longer, the colors are coming from the back and they're very faint on the front. And the more that you look at the middle, the more the colors on the outside of your peripheral vision start to shift. And so the colors, um, basically they start to look like you're disappearing. 
And I think that's also because this is undyed wool. This is completely natural wool. And, um, and so I think it's actually soaking the color into itself. <laughs> so there's a lot of really interesting color play. And the longer you look at this work, the more you get. Um, and I also love this work because I talked a lot about works being woven together and how that's actually not their structure. And so this work is hand woven um, and felted, but the weaving actually has nothing to do with the integrity of how the work is held up. It's still felting that, that binds it. And so I think that's also a really special spin <laughs> on, on fiber and craft history and how I'm kind of making my mark in that way. Well, this kind of that segues into another question from Bureau Home. Uh, speak a little more on the process um, uh, transition from hand felting and machine felting. Or can you speak a little more on the process from hand felting to machine felting? Um, how did that influence your patient, or sorry, your practice, uh, and your um, thoughts about the work? Yeah, wow. Well, and you can, again, you can see Lee Riddle has set up an amazing online display and you can see everything and there's a video at the bottom of me working on the large machine. But the, the larger felting machine, it really created a lot of unknown for me because I would lay out the wool onto the silk and I would push it through. But as I'm pushing it through the needle, there's 3,000 needles that are punching. And so as I'm pushing it through, the the wool is being sucked into the machine. And so it actually come out looking completely different than I originally laid down. So the reason I started hand felting was to gain some control over, you know, how things were laid out. And um, I just, I didn't like losing that control. So I think that the felting machine, I'll, I'll go and use it and I'll lay it down one color now. And I just get a base down because it makes it easier to layer if you have a base pat it down. Um, and, and hand felting just gives me yeah, a lot more control. It, it allows me to play with the wool. The wool can, can kind of show up in different ways where when it's all being pushed through a machine, it's all being pushed through the same level of pressure and the same, you know, the same speed. And so all of the, the wools, they start to look the same essentially. Mm -hmm. And so hand felting mm -hmm. allows the wool to look a lot of different ways. Yeah. Even though it's the same school, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And you can definitely see that here on, on these works here on the surface quality um, and, and yeah, the variation that you're able to te tease out. Um, yeah, it's really, really fantastic. Um, well, any other questions out there? Send, send them in. Um, I think maybe we can take one more. If, somebody comes in. Otherwise, um, um, let's, anything else you want to add? Um, <laughs> what's, what's going on? Uh, gosh, I don't think so. I mean, I really shared a lot of information that most people yeah. would not know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're very lucky. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to share with you all. And I really want to send huge gratitude and appreciation to Re Riddle for having me and showing my work. Re Riddle is amazing. Um, the show is up until the end of the month. It's on their website. The link is in my Instagram bio, which is Ms. Liz Moore, and also in Re Riddle Gallery's bio. And um, I hope you enjoy it. And um, you can email the gallery about the work. And um, if you ever have any questions or thoughts, I always just love to hear what people are thinking, especially in this time where we're still kind of getting used to being around each other. <laughs> so definitely, definitely. yeah. And thank you so much for coming. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. It's okay. always great to be in an artist studio and hearing hearing from the person themselves about their work and what they do. And and um, was taught me so much about um, her process and <laughs> what you know and what she does, and also just the um, you know the world of working with these fibers and, and the, the amazing history that she's working with and really pushing forward, uh, uh, which is not only through, you know, 
the material history, but also the art history that's going on and the work um, that's been that, that that has been done in these different areas that she's that she's exploring. So this has been fantastic. Reroll is great. Thanks for thanks for hosting us. It was fantastic. Um, I think that. Um, Let's see if there's any last questions. Um, I think I think we've got it. I think okay. we've got it. It's been great. Thank you Thanks so everybody. much for coming. Good. And save it. It's gonna yeah. Please save it. I think I'm still recording. Okay.